Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, more than 100 people, years of work, and dozens of recommendations pushed to the side as the governor quietly closed the book on New Mexico's Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Relatives Task Force. Still today, I'm in complete shock. We have to support one another because no one else is there to support one another. Celebrating Native American Heritage Month at our libraries. How learning to make something like decorative moccasins can help bridge a widening cultural gap. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Laura Paskus in the chair where you've been seeing a lot of Lou DeVizio over the past few months. This week, we'll be focusing on indigenous issues from around the state. The majority of our time will be spent on Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham's decision to quietly shut down the state's missing and murdered Indigenous Women and Relatives Task Force. The news has upset and disappointed former task force members and families whose children, parents, and other loved ones have been murdered or gone missing and whose cases remain unsolved. In October, reporter Bella Davis broke this story at New Mexico In Depth. She sits down in the studio with a member of the disbanded task force and a mother whose son was murdered. Three years after his death, she's still waiting for answers from investigators. But we begin this week with Secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior, Deb Holland. This summer, Holland announced an order ending oil and gas leases on federal lands in a 10-mile radius around Chaco Culture National Historic Park. In an interview you will see only on New Mexico in Focus, correspondent Antonia Gonzalez talks to Holland, and she asks her to respond to activists who say the federal government is not doing enough to protect the greater Chaco landscape. Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, welcome to New Mexico in Focus. Thank you, I'm so happy to be here, Antonia. And you've been leading the Interior Department for more than two years now. You've worked on a number of initiatives for American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Reflecting on your time so far, what has surprised you the most about the, poli the possibilities, but also the limitations of the job? Well, I, I can't say that I was necessarily surprised, but I feel like, you know, ha being in this position with such a wonderful team of people, um, you know, leadership in the department that we've been able to really uh, get a lot done. I am grateful that uh, President Biden is committed to Indian country. Uh, he made sure that all of us across the entire administration um, are uh, committed to tribal consultation, robust tribal consultation. And I think that in and of itself has been one of the driving um, factors behind us accomplishing so much. It's making sure that tribes have a seat at the table. Uh, Alaska Natives or Indian tribes in the lower 48, as well as Native Hawaiians, um, have a voice at the decision-making table. And, and I think that has helped us tremendously to accomplish so much. And here in New Mexico, as New Mexico's representative, you were a vocal, um, active proponent for protecting the greater Chaco Canyon, Canyon uh, landscape here from oil and gas development. As Interior Secretary, however, the department's Honoring Chaco Initiative has been widely criticized for not protecting the area enough. Are your hands tied at the department on this issue? Well, I am very proud of what we have been able to do, uh, withdraw of you know, minerals in a 10 mile radius around the, uh, the National Historical Park. Um, we feel that in and of itself will, um, you know, that buffer zone will absolutely ensure that um, the, the cultural history that is in that park is protected and um, that was really the focus of what we wanted to do. And when you were here, there were some protests. Um, can you talk a little bit about the complexities of the, chocker, the checkerboard area? Sure, well, um, as we have said uh, time and again, the withdrawal only covers federal land, so it doesn't touch any 
private land or allotted lands uh, uh, for any people living in the area. It's only a protection for federal lands. Um, and of course, um, we had so many conversations across New Mexico with uh, members of tribes, including the Navajo Nation in various parts of New Mexico. We extended the public comment period so that folks had a chance to weigh in uh, with their thoughts. We got uh, over 100,000 comments, which is a lot. Um, and we considered all of those um, perspectives as we were um, working on the withdrawals. And we do have to ask about the investigation by the House Natural Resources Committee. Have you been interviewed about that? I have not been interviewed by the House Natural Resources Committee. Do you have anything to respond to, to allegations um, with the connection to the Pueblo Alliance? Oh, sure. Well, of course, I, uh, you know, we have an ethics department at the Department of the, we have an ethics office at the Department of the Interior. Um, I follow every single ethics advice. I follow all the rules. I am, I feel very confident that I have not um, breached any uh, protocols or, or ethics recusals that that have been placed on me. I am, I am, I am committed to ensuring that I do everything in the most ethical uh, way. Um, I feel, uh, Antonia, I feel like I'm a role model for the younger generation, and certainly for you know when I think about my nieces and nephews, all of those young Native folks who call me auntie. Um, I feel committed to uh, being a role model, and so. I do everything in the best possible way I can. Well, let's move on to your boarding school initiative that just uh, wrapped up. Can you share a little bit about um, what you found so far? In so many instances, uh, folks have told us that uh, they were reluctant to share a thing with their families, but felt it was time to finally say something about the experiences that they have had. We feel that is, you know, that's healing for, for people. And uh, that was the purpose of, of our road to healing was to really start um, healing for the country. This, this is a history that all Americans share, not just Native Americans. And so ensuring that we are uh, open and honest about the past history of this country was, is, has been really important to us. And I, I think overall, uh, it's been a really good experience for everyone who has participated. And how can your agency further healing efforts in tribal communities when it comes to boarding school and the impacts of boarding schools? We're building some new schools. Uh, we're refurbishing some schools. We're, we're making sure that Indian students uh, have opportunities to learn in, in their own way. Um, additionally, we are looking forward to uh, an oral history project. It will be housed with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And um, as, I, as I mentioned, Native American history is American history. And so we want to make sure that um, that, that information is open to um, the, the, our larger uh, countries so that people can learn. And, and you know, it, it, it'll take a lot to heal, but uh, certainly ensuring that uh, we can help with things that Indian communities have, have lost during these assimilation policies. And namely, I should say, um, native languages. That was a topic that was so often reiterated around the country. Um, and so we know that President Biden has been incredibly supportive of native language preservation and will continue with that as well. And another important issue to you is missing and murdered indigenous people. The Not Invisible Act Commission just released its recommendations. Uh, what stood out to you? So, oh gosh, we're so, you know, I, I, we worked on the Not Invisible Act Commission when I was a member of Congress. We felt very strongly that uh, that nobody can have all the answers, and this has to be a concerted effort. So um, we're we're proud uh, that we were able to pass the Not Invisible Act uh, during the time I was in Congress, and then now implement it while I'm Secretary of the Interior. Um, we uh, we hope to uh, 
uh, respond to that uh, to those recommendations, and we'll we'll just keep you informed as as we move along. But Phil, you know, it, missing and murdered Indigenous peoples is um, it's a it's an issue that has been present here um, since colonization started on this continent. Um, it's going to take more than a few pieces of legislation to remedy uh, this really horrible. Um, you know, these horrible events. And so um, we're going to keep working on it. You might know also that we have a missing and murder unit that we started in 2021 uh, that increased investigations across the country. We have investigators housed um, at a, in every region of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And uh, we're putting concerted uh, time, funding and effort toward ensuring that we can solve these cases, that we can help families um, to heal in that respect as well. And Secretary um, Deb Holland, you've made history a few times here, <laughs> becoming a Native woman serving in Congress and also leading the Interior Department. As a Native woman leader, um, you had mentioned that you do feel responsibility. So what kind of responsibility do you feel for helping American Indian and Alaska Native communities as a woman leader? Thank you. Well, you know, when I ran for Congress in 2018, uh, my slogan was Congress has never heard a voice like mine. Um, the president decided that and he promised that his cabinet would look would look like America. And uh, and so I, I feel like all of us recognize the value that differing perspectives bring to the decision-making table. Uh, you know, I, um, when I do my road to healings, I start out saying this is the first time in history that a cabinet secretary has come to the table with the shared trauma of, of the people who are in the room. And so, um, you know, my, my grandparents were, um, they were survivors of the boarding school. We have in our, on the Pueblo of Laguna and across the country, um, Indian tribes have have lived by the decisions that the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the larger um, differing administrations have made for them. And so it's important that we have those voices at the table. And so in that respect, uh, we have a, a, a large number of Native people serving at high governmental uh, levels, at decision-making levels. Um, Director Shelley Lowe uh, from the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, for example, she's from the Navajo Nation, um, and so it, it's important that that when you have those perspectives uh, at the table, you know that folks will bring in uh, their experiences, their knowledge, uh, the things that they were taught by their grandparents, um, and I feel that uh, when I'm when I am. Um, you know, making decisions uh, for the department, I feel very strongly that uh, that my perspective, my knowledge, my experience of my Pueblo and military upbringing um, influence the decisions I make. And, and so um, I think that's a good thing. Perspectives, uh, differing perspectives is important. And Secretary Holland, People across Indian country lovingly call you Auntie Deb or Auntie Deb. <laughs> so what is next for you and your goals um, for American Indians and Alaska Native people uh, leading the Interior Department? Thank you so much. Well, we have, you know, we're so blessed to have uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, and, uh, and in fact, the, um, the uh, the various pieces of legislation that uh, President Biden has signed into law, we're going to keep making sure that we can uh, help tribes to uh, to realize this funding in the best ways possible for their communities. Um, there are, um, you know, and, and I should also say uh, one of the things that I'm particularly proud of that we've done um, is we have helped tribes to enter into co-stewardship agreements with us, co-stewardship of our public lands. Uh, we have done 20 already, 
Um, we signed uh, the management uh, the management uh, opportunities for, in fact, for the National Bison Range over to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. There's a fish hatchery in Idaho uh, that the Nez Perce tribe is managing now. Um, those co-stewardship opportunities will continue. We sign these agreements. Uh, tribes help us uh, with their um, indigenous knowledge, their traditional knowledge that um, that will help to steward our lands. Um, we have 60 more of those agreements in the works. And so um, I think uh, making sure that we are managing our public lands, that's one of our big missions for the Department of the Interior that it's an all hands on deck moment in this era of climate change that we'll be able to do some really wonderful things uh, for the American people. And before we let you go, um, happy Native American Heritage Month. What is your message? What would you like to tell the public? Well, I, I, I appreciate that, Antonia. Looks, you know, for so long, um, I know that tribes have struggled uh, to be heard. Um, you know, invisibility was really one of our worst enemies. We could, we could, you know, we could say things, we could advocate for things. Um, people wouldn't hear us. And I, I feel that um, now is our opportunity just to uh, have our voices heard. And um, I'm so proud uh, of the youth who have uh, really taken um, their leadership position seriously, uh, working for the betterment of our environment, of our ecosystems, of our entire country. Um, I want to encourage every Native youth uh, to do whatever they can to learn their language. That uh, their traditional languages are the most important thing that will connect them to their people, and um, and we and into the future, uh, teaching their children and grandchildren how to speak their languages. Um, I think that's one of the best ways we can honor our ancestors. Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, thank you so much for joining thank us you. on New Mexico PBS. Thank you, Antonia. Our elders are slowly, slowly going away. And it's not until, for example, a small family, they lose one of their elders, there goes the teachings. And then there goes the language. And of course, they take that with them. And so we really need to see and diminish that gap. And this is a way for them to do that. And at the same time, have fun with it. Because if you're not having fun with it, what are you really learning? <laughs> Four years ago, state legislators created a new task force dedicated to identifying, defining, and addressing the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous people. The state took action after a study from the Urban Indian Health Institute that showed New Mexico led the nation in missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Then in 2021, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham signed an executive order expanding the task force. It also empowered members to seek solutions. The task force set to work building partnerships among tribes and law enforcement agencies, connecting families and communities, and coming up with a report more than 100 pages long, full of short and long term strategies. But in a move that surprised its members, the governor's administration shut down that task force. In collaboration with New Mexico In Depth, reporter Bella Davis interviews Darlene Gomez, an attorney and former task force member, and Vanjie Randall Shorty, a Diné mother whose son, Zachariah, was murdered. Davis asks where this decision leaves their work and the families relying upon it. Vanjie, Darlene, thank you so much for joining me today on New Mexico In Focus. We're here to talk about the disbanding of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Relatives Task Force by Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham's administration earlier this year um, and what that means going forward in a state that's been deeply impacted by um, this national crisis of disproportionate violence against Indigenous people. Um, Banji, over the past few years, you've become um, an advocate not only for your son, Zachariah, but also for other Indigenous families who have lost loved ones. Um, to start, can you tell us about who your son was? 
My son, Zachariah Juwan Shorty, he was 23 years old, um, loved music, loved tattooing, was a very fun person, loving person. He was a dad. He was a grandson, a brother, and my baby. Um, starting life, starting life. He went out with some friends and to make music went missing, was found four days later on the Navajo reservation and he was murdered. And three years later, I'm here because I'm still waiting for answers. I just recently found out that um, his um, the FBI agent working on his case, um, she's no longer in the office. And so we have a new agent and I'm still waiting to meet with that agent as well. Um, as far as the New Mexico task force, you know, I've been very devastated with that. I, when it first started, I had hopes, you know, that not only myself, but other families had hopes of, you know, bringing their loved ones home. And in my case, you know, getting justice for Zach. And again, three years, three years later, I'm still waiting. And with it ending, you know, where do we go from here is my question. I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, you Thank touched you. on this a little bit, but what are some of the challenges that you faced in trying to get justice for your son? Lack of communication and jurisdiction. You know, the um, we have different organizations from the very beginning, you know, as far as when I went back to making that first phone call when he went missing, that was with the Farmington Police Department. And then when he was found, he was found on the Nav Navajo reservation. So having to deal with the Navajo Nation Police Department, the detectives from San Juan County, and the criminal investigator from Navajo Nation, and then back to the F FBI having, you know, the case in their hands. And it's, and then, you know, through this um, task force, being involved with the BIA Missing and Murdered Unit as well. So having them all together, and uh, it feels like there's been that power struggle of, okay, we don't have the case, they have the case. Okay, we have to contact Navajo Nation. We have, to, no, FBI has the case. So just, you know, pointing, finger pointing is what it seems to have been the, these past three years. And going back to um, about six months ago, the governor's administration um, made the decision to, to disband the task force um, that was really created to find um, solutions to the challenges you just described, um, along with so many others. Um, Darlene, what did you think and feel when you learned the task force was done? So I was invited to a task force summit meeting, which occurred, I think, in June. And at that time, I was not told that this was going to be a meeting ending the task force. So 121 people were invited to that meeting and I would say maybe 25 showed up. So throughout the meeting, the summit, we were talking about, you know, how to take care of ourselves and we were hearing from a, a woman who is the governor of a Pueblo and just, you know, some really moving stories about people within the movement. So at the very last, before it closed, we were told that the MMIW task force was going to be ending. So I, of course, after Melody Delmar came off the stage, I talked to her and I said, really, are you going to do a press release? Are you gonna make a public announcement? Because nobody knows and there's only like 25 of us in this room. So I left that day still not really realizing that it was a true and correct statement that the task force was ended. So I kind of went on the next six months not getting calls from anyone from the New Mexico 
Indian Affairs Department, nothing about the task force. And then I think I received a call from, from you, Bella, asking me if indeed this was true. And I said, yeah, I heard about it in May or June, but I never saw a press release. I never saw a public announcement and I had been looking for them. So still today, I'm in complete shock because although we finished the, we came up with the plan, the state plan as it's called, but that was a whole year and a half ago. And so we were led to believe all the way up until May or June that this was continuing, that we were in the second phase of implementing the 60 page plan. So even today, you know, it's still hard to believe that we're actually disbanded. And we just came back from a meeting with the Indian Affairs Division and a representative of Michelle Lujan Grisham's office because we really feel like there needs to be a new executive order extending the task force into em implementing the plan. You, um, the two of you were one of a, a few dozen people who, who went to Santa Fe um, in October to protest the disbanding of the task force. Um, what were you um, hoping to get out of that protest? Maybe, Banji, if we could start with you. Answers. Yeah, um, you know, I was shocked, lots of emotions. I was upset, like, you know, wondering, one to know why they said the task force ended because, you know, from my point of view, from being Zachariah's mom, their job is not done. It's far from being done. And I think, you know, all they did was gather statistics, which I don't think are even accurate. You know, there's more than 181 people that are missing and, you know, murdered and those that are missing have not returned home. In Zach's case, with you know him being murdered, I'm still waiting for justice, and so their task force is far from being done. At that protest um, in Santa Fe, you all met with a spokeswoman for the governor and um, asked for a meeting, which Darlene, you mentioned, just recently happened. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, sort of the explanation that you got for why the task force has been disbanded? So initially when we did our protest, our rally, I think one of the things that we wanted the governor's office to know is that we will not be silenced, that we have been silenced for far too long and that we all have voices. Zachariah's mom's his voice. We have uh, Calvin Martinez, Becky is his voice. And we wanted to show that we're united, that you could take this task force away, but we're still pushing for answers. So what we learned that day was that the governor's team felt that the executive order had been fulfilled because we did have this MMIW state response plan. So in their mind, that was the end of the executive order. So it felt like to me that they had not really implemented anything from that plan and were a whole year and a half later. So one of my questions was, well, why did you go a whole year and a half letting us believe that this task force was still gonna be working together? And so basically she said, well, you know, I apologize, maybe we should have been more transparent by doing a press release. And, you know, we are not saying it's ending, quote, but it's just on to a different phase that is not covered under the executive order. So in today's meeting, you know, we came up with all of us collectively that came to the meeting today and also the other families that couldn't make it. We came up with some ideas on what uh, Indian Affairs Division and the governor's office could do immediately. One was to have a MMIWR link on the page. So that would allow everyone to see what, who is missing and then also to allow each family to, to tell their story, who their loved one was. Because oftentimes I feel like people don't realize behind a statistic there's an actual person that is being missed and that's loved. And one of the second things is that we really wanted the governor's office and internal affairs division to have a resource list where families could go to have a resource list. And we also asked that a new executive order be drafted by the governor 
for the second part of the MMIWR task force, and that would be the implement, implementation team. And I think, you know, for me, one of the things with this task force ending is that I no longer have access to the 121 people who were a part of the task force, because oftentimes it would be the FBI, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, the district attorney, and we were able to talk to them and say like, hey, I, you know, I called you two weeks ago. Do you have a few minutes to talk? Or I also had a list of everybody who was on that task force, and I was able to call like the Farmington Police Department and ask about a case. And it also gave all the members a chance to trust one another, because when I say something, I'm gonna do it. And there's all these misconceptions in the paper you know, I'm this activist that's always yelling and screaming, but then when people met me, they just knew that I had a passion for finding our missing and murdered. And so it basically wiped away that link. So I'm in the silo by myself with the families. We're our own, we, we have to support one another because no one else is there to support one another. And without this task force, the governor's office and the Indian Affairs Division, they can't force people to work on this plan because we have federal agencies that they have no control over. We have sovereign nations that they have no control over. It goes to nonprofits. So I felt like this task force allowed everybody to be cohesive and work on a plan, no matter what agency they came from. And everybody was really dedicated to it. So to just end it and say, you know, I heard the Indian Affairs Secretary Mountain state that they wanted to hire four more individuals. Well, what's four more individuals going to do when you had 121 experts in MMIW are from on the ground, family members, advocates, law enforcement, legislatures? You can't get that in four people. So those were some of our questions today, like what does this mean? And then we also were really frank about getting data because we were told, oh yeah, we've been working on this this entire time. But when we pressed the governor's office and the Secretary of Indian Affairs office, they couldn't provide exact data for us or they couldn't tell us what steps that they took to implement the plan. They said, oh, we're following this plan. Well, the plan is 60 pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you talked about the, the plan um, that it does, it contains so many recommendations. Um, dozens of recommendations from better data collection to you know, funding for liaisons who could help affected families um, navigate the criminal justice system. Um, I'm wondering for you, Vanjie, if there are any particular recommendations um, from that response plan that you, you feel like state leaders should really be prioritizing. I think that open communication back up, you know, just like Darlene had stated, she can't just pick up the phone and reach these different organizations, you know, it's not there anymore. So I think that needs to be, you know, addressed and open back up, you know, she's, she's my, Darlene's my resource, my go-to person, you know, and then she's, she's that middle person and it helps me connect with the FBI and whoever else that I need to contact on Zach's behalf. And Darlene, as an attorney, you're so familiar with kind of how these cases work when we talk about kind of the criminal justice system. Um, and so for you, are there any recommendations that really stand out from the response plan? Well, I think one is the community engagement, like engaging the community and having resources for them. Because I work with 20 families and there is no resources. There is nonprofits who get dollars for MMIWR, but to have them actually advocate for the families and help the families. It's not going to those families directly. It's like big trainings. Um, I really think the data collection is vital. And I felt like with the task force being um, together, like we had governors from Pueblos, we had presidents from like the Hickory Apache Indian tribe, Muscalero, and we had the people sitting at the table from all the sovereign nations who could commit to saying like, okay, I'll give you our data. Give me what data we're gonna follow. Give me you know, the, the standard model and I'll take it back to my tribe and we will implement it. Well, now that it's not there and so many tribal leaders have a hundred things on their plates. 
So I felt like the task force made everybody accountable. And it made people really want to be like, okay, well, I'm going to show you what our nation's doing. I'm showing you what the FBI is doing. So I felt that this also gave people the incentive to start new programs in their office so they can get on the media and say like, hey, look what we're doing, it's really working. And I think that was really relevant with the FBI when they started the missing person in New Mexico, Native American, a list of pictures that comes out once a month. And that took a lot of work and it took a lot of commitment from the FBI. But I think that part, you know, partially it was because there was this forum where we were able to tell them like, this is what we need. And I think oftentimes law enforcement doesn't really get the opportunity to know the victims' families or the advocates. And they can learn so much from Vanji and the rest of the families, they can learn from me. And we can also talk to them. And when they tell us like, look, these are our barriers, we're able to, f to fight for them, whether it's in Congress or at the state level. And we all know that everybody is underfunded, lack of resources, lack of officers, but that doesn't give anyone the excuse not to properly investigate MMIWR. So at this point, there's, um there's some disagreement about how um, we as a state should move forward. You talked about how you know the Indian Affairs Department has um, a requested funding from the legislature for four full-time employees um, to focus on carrying out the task force recommendations. Um, and then sort of on the other hand, there are a few um, state lawmakers who have expressed interest in bringing the task force back. Um, and I think part of the idea there is that it's giving the task force um, sort of longevity instead of having another um, executive order. Um, so I'm wondering for you, Darlene, what you hope um, to see happen during this upcoming legislative session. Well, we have collectively asked for a statute that would make the Indian Affairs or the Murdered Missing Indigenous Women and Relatives Task Force a standalone division. Um, we were told today that that's something that's not possible from the governor's office. So you know, we really need it into statute. If that's not something that is possible with the governor, then we're gonna have to ask, ask our state legislatures to put it in statute. Because New Mexico's ranked number one in the entire nation for missing and murdered indigenous people. I don't foresee that we're going to be 50th at any time soon. So this is an issue that has gone back to the 1900s and earlier when, you know, Spain came into New Mexico, Arizona. And so this is just generational and this is not gonna end. And so just to think that four people are gonna be able to control this, that's not anything that is uh, possible. So we need to extend it all the way, you know, until we're no longer on this earth because it is an issue and has been an issue for a very long time. Well, Vanjie, Darlene, thank you both so much for your time for joining me today. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for listening. Thank you again to Bella Davis. She first reported the governor had disbanded the task force last month, and in her latest story for New Mexico In Depth, she reveals that State Attorney General Raul Torres has failed to spend a million dollars set aside by the state legislature nearly two years ago to help track cases of missing indigenous people. You can read that and all of her work at nmindepth.com. Right now, we've got more on that topic. Jana Pfeiffer was appointed to that same state task force. She's also been a vocal advocate on the issue for years. So has Sharina Baker, who recently organized an event honoring missing indigenous people through art and conversation. This week, Antonia Gonzalez spoke with both of them about their grassroots initiatives now that the state's task force has been shut down and how human trafficking is fueling the crisis. Jana and Sharina, welcome to New Mexico in Focus. Thank you for having Thank us. You. And you've both dedicated years long work to addressing missing and murdered indigenous relatives issues, including advocacy and research. Uh, Sharina, I wanna start with you. You've done recent work working with UNM, CNM, and SIPI. Tell me why that's important. So um, this work for me goes back many years when I went to Haskell, which is an all-Native university. 
um, Native American University. And so um, I started understanding that like this was a common problem and I started looking more into it. So when I did my master's, I started reading more books about it. Um, but when I moved here, I wanted to focus on college students because I feel that we would reach more, a more span of people if we are educating our college students, especially our Native women and, and boys, um, so that when they go back to their reservations and they go back to their homes and they can talk about it at the table and bring it up in their community, um, we felt it was really important that we can reach out to the college students and they can educate their younger ones and educate their older ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jana, you've done a lot of work on this issue um, as well, including serving on different task, task forces. Um, how does the crime of human trafficking fit in? So human trafficking is prevalent here in the city of Albuquerque, and we are noticing within the past decade how within metropolis cities, a lot of our Native people are transient um, communities where they are able to live in their communities but also travel to the city for work, um, groceries, or you know if they get paid monthly, they want to have um, you know get their food and so forth. So. Um, that has allowed a lot of our native communities to come um, to the metropolis city. So with that issue, we're seeing here in the city of Albuquerque, a lot of the homeless population, um, maybe they are not able to afford their rent, um, they're not getting a proper job, um, income revenue that's um, sustaining their families. They find themselves homeless on the uh, streets as well. And so we have different areas here in the city where we're identifying um, a huge populations of unsheltered relatives. And unfortunately, um, one route in particular is Central, where we're identifying certain bus stops where uh, a lot of the homeless people um, can be picked up. Um, drug is all, also a contributing factor, as well as substance abuse. And unfortunately, um, when you see vulnerable populations that are unsheltered on, their, on, on the streets, uh, a lot of these um, traffickers and individuals who don't have good intentions will see a person who's in a very vulnerable state and take advantage of that. And have you seen any changes um, when it comes to outreach? Because you've done outreach yourself as well. Yes. Or even just combating it. Mm -hmm. So I have seen a lot of um, changes with street outreach. Um, it's very common now that our, a lot of our community grassroots organizations, um, community members as well, such as Sharina, is also recognizing the importance of really um, extending a helping hand to a lot of our unsheltered relatives and making sure that if they are needing some form of um, housing assistance, um, the city of Albuquerque is really good at providing some solutions to that. In addition, um, a food kitchen with First Nations Community Health Source, um, a lot of integrative um, wraparound services, e either behavioral health or medical services, those are some of the main services that are presented to unsheltered relatives on the streets so that they can be connected and, and hopefully um, begin their healing journey to you know stepping away from being vulnerable and unsheltered on the streets. So street outreach is a very important um, component when it comes to meeting where the, um, our relatives that are most vulnerable on the streets and, and really link them to important services. And your work as well, um, talking to college students about human trafficking and holding events. There was a recent event that you helped organize. Um, share a little bit about that, and that was at SIPI. Yeah, so um, a few years ago, 2016 actually, so quite a few years ago, um, there was an earring exhibit that was going around, um, and it had been started, and so the earrings represent, like when you miss, when you're missing one earring, it kind of is like an analogy for like, you missing a relative because they're just not complete. Um, so we created um, an exhibit for that to like represent and display. And then around that we have conversations about, um, we bring in professionals. So I wouldn't consider myself a professional, but we um, in the, that line of work, even though I do have experience, um, but we bring in people who are in the, in the thick of it, whether they are um, like, Anita Lucchese, who is the director for the Sovereign Bodies Institute, and her sole job is just to really help Native communities nationally, and I think even internationally they've helped. Um, and so 
we kind of highlight them and we let them speak and we have dialogue and we open it up for our college students but we not only open it up for them but their families the community as well and we can really like educate on that level but then also um, now we're going to start doing more events where it's more action and so we would like to do um, we are doing in april um, next semester or i guess next or in the spring um, we are going to do self-defense classes and like different techniques. Um, I also educate on like, I'll do streams of TikToks of like these women who have like been experiencing these and they talk about it or they say this is a technique they'll use, you know, just to educate that these are real things that are happening or, or I almost got abducted and it shows like faces or, or girls that are, you know, they can see themselves in their um, in those videos and that they can try to prevent that whether it's like if somebody's following you around target or if somebody is you know is tying something to your car door or um putting what is that the cream shaving cream on your window so then when you go like this you can't see and then you know our money it's you know there's so many different techniques and so our different strategies um so that we try to educate um and then they can further that education <laughs> outwards. So we're trying to like reach a wide span of, span of people. Yeah. And why are these efforts important to the grassroots? Um, and you're bringing in, like you said, experts, but from the grassroots level and also younger voices, why is it important that uh, raising awareness among these younger generations and having also younger generations be involved in addressing the issues? Yeah, so unfortunately um, there is not a lot of now there's starting to become like the task force but unfortunately that has been um i guess that has ended um but it really comes from the community it really comes from us saying there's a need for this and we can't depend on the state to take action um, so we need to do what we can what our capacity is to really like educate and pre do preventative work um, because unfortunately we're not always protected in, by the state or by, you know, America. <laughs> so I think it's really important that the grassroots movement is key to bringing awareness to protection, to helping victims, to helping families of victims. Um, and it really takes a community to really help and um, educate, prevent, um, and take it to congress take it to whatever we need to protest you know bring awareness of what is really happening and why why are we being targeted as a people as, as a race um, talk about what is happening really on reservations off reservations in the city how how is this becoming one in three women but really in reality um it's like almost every woman i've ever met native woman has had an experience um, of sexual violence, domestic violence, almost being kidnapped um, or kidnapped or just a plethora of, of things and ways that we have been targeted as, as a people. Yeah. And uh, Jana, uh, we mentioned the task force, the state mm -hmm. task force has been dissolved. You've worked on, like we mentioned earlier, a number of federal level and the state task force as well. What would you like to see happen mm -hmm. from the state now? So we were able to develop a, a state response plan, and so, which was released in 2022. And so I'm recognizing that a lot of other agencies and states do look to the state of New Mexico when it comes to how do we lead when it comes to MMIP relatives um, task force in that work. And so other states, they do want to mirror the same objectives and goals that we've been able to kind of establish with the task force. And I believe that some of the objectives that were and goals that were mentioned in that state response, um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, for, for example, I was um, sitting on the systems subcommittee and that is where we were able to pretty much um, really look into um, state agencies and how are they responding um, when it comes to 
um, investigating and prevention measures and in the cases that come before them, that process and, you know, who is accountable to, to making sure that these um, cases are investigated um, within missing and murdered Indigenous relatives. So that was an, uh, um, a very important component. We had other uh, subcommittees such as the data and the community impact um, subcommittees. And so a lot of work was generated from those um, subcommittees and which really in essence was the um, bulk of the work from the state response plan. So I, I hope that we can move forward and, and really um, assess the need of the task force. I know there's a lot of effort from community members that want to continue the task force and really calling upon the Indian Affairs Department to see how we can um, move forward with the task force and in, in you know requiring some accountability as well with some of these objectives and goals that we had in the state response plan. Well there's definitely a lot of work going on on various levels on this issue and I want to thank you both for coming in and talking a little bit today and we're definitely going to be following this. Thank you both. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Antonia. In our final segment of the week, we head to a public library branch in Albuquerque, where staff and neighbors are celebrating Native American Heritage Month. The city's entire library system is participating, displaying books from Native authors and films about Native American culture. But at the San Pedro Library, one staffer took it a step further by hosting Navajo crafting classes. Antonia Gonzalez and our crew went for a demonstration earlier this month, learning to make a decorative vase in the style of traditional Navajo moccasins, all while gaining a deeper understanding of Native culture and tradition. From these crafts, they have really opened a whole range of people that want to learn their culture and their traditions again and at the same time keep up with it and be able to tell their little ones in the future and the reason why people should see how important that is is because we are experiencing a culture gap and I love how for this craft I'm using the traditional colors because this burgundy looking color represents the earth and everything about the moccasin, especially the female moccasin, has a purpose. Traditionally, they're made from leather. So if I'm actually wearing um, female moccasins, and this is made of leather, wrap it around. And then, of course, we have kind of like the red material and, of course, buckskin again, which is kind of harder on the bottom. So today we're going to be making a moccasin flower bouquet. So um, we have our felt fabric, and then I do have our white strands. I have a pair of scissors, pencil, some green foam for the end result, some stuffing to give it that fluff, and of course a red Solo cup, nothing in there. Um, glue stick, and of course our little bouquet. You can change these flowers uh, with whatever you like, uh, but I thought I'd just go with like a an array of flowers that kind of go through different colors to make it pop, um, especially if you want to use it as a centerpiece. Um, so I'm a library paraprofessional here at the San Pedro Library, and I am a resource to our diverse and wonderful community. Um, we serve a plethora of people that come in on a daily, and I am so excited to hear different languages come in and fill this little library of the cultural it's a cultural resource is what it is. And the fact that people are using it on the daily and bringing their kids here is very wonderful. And I'm glad that I'm always here behind a desk with a huge smile on my face, ready to serve them. One, one of the things to really know about libraries is that we know it's paramount that the libraries develop partnerships with community leaders, organizers, um, our neighbors, to listen to their stories and um, really understand the cultural responsive needs that they bring to the table. And how did the Native American crafts come about? I've always wanted to do them um, ever since I moved off the reservation into Albuquerque, just as sort of a hobby. And in doing so, I've taught myself so much and I realize that I'm not the only one out there that wants to do these crafts. I realize I'm not the only one out there that wants to relearn our traditions. 
and at the same time have fun with it and create beautiful stuff like this. And so this month is celebrating Native, Native American Heritage Month. And so you're going to see movies, events for, for adults, events for children, events for seniors that really um, showcase and celebrate Native American heritage and Native American culture. And then it will take some time, but that's okay. Because Navajo culture, if you take your time, put good thoughts into it, good things will come out, no matter what. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and take my glue gun and do a very, 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 very small. That's not small, but we'll go ahead and smooth it out. And then we are gonna work our way around it. Hold it there for one second. And then we're gonna continue to go around. And how big was your school that you went to where you learned this? Very, very, very small. Um, I did not know that graduating classes could reach up to the hundreds. Oh, really? Mine was only 14. Oh, okay. And what was you, the name of your school? Boulder Lake Community School, located 30 miles west of Albuquerque, probably like 10, 15 minutes from the actual highway. A wonderful school, though. I mean, I'm so glad I actually grew up there, immersed in my culture. My mom worked within the school. So what does that mean? I grew up there, <laughs> waiting for her to get off, yeah. um, literally sleeping underneath the office desk, and just waiting for her to finish. Our elders are slowly, slowly going away. And it's not until, for example, a small family, they lose one of their elders, there goes the teachings, and then there goes the language. And of course, they take that with them. And so we really need to see and diminish that gap. And this is a way for them to do that. And at the same time, have fun with it. Because if you're not having fun with it, what are you really learning? <laughs> so of course, we have our um, Navajo moccasin, which holds a little flower bouquet. And at the same time, um, we do have our rug crafting event that um, people are able to do weaving and at the same time learn why they actually get to see a loom. They actually get to see the traditional weaving tools. And there's only so much a child can learn by just looking at a piece of paper with the picture on it and a short description. I want them to be able to hold it and actually look through it. Because 50 years ago today, our children would actually be sent to boarding schools and forced to deconstruct their culture. In doing so, you know, they're taking away their indigenous cultural identity, which is very, very important for us, especially now. It is, it is really critical to have a, a diverse set of staff, especially staff that can share the lived experiences of our neighbors, of our communities. So um, whether it is the, there's, you know, the language barrier, there's people here that speak Spanish as, as a community, their first language is Spanish. There are people here who speak Navajo. We have people who speak Navajo. So it is extremely important to make sure that we have that diversity to celebrate our neighbors and our community so that they see themselves reflected in this space because this is their space, this is their library, and that's how we want to celebrate it. Okay, wonderful. So mine's looking pretty, pretty good. And so we're gonna go ahead and get our little stuff in. And like I said, I did this in fourth grade and it looked like clown feet, so be sure to stuff it. <laughs> stuff it good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you don't want the flat. Yes, I know. <laughs> yes, my mom showed me it and it was terrible. So I told her I made you a new one <laughs> and it looks better this time. Definitely redeemed myself. How important is it to share, especially during Native American Heritage Month, to be able to do this here at the library? It's been wonderful. I feel like I am doing my job. I feel like I am doing all that I can to cater to the younger generation, the older generation. So mine is done. Yours looks very, very beautiful. And that is going to be our Navajo Magazine Craft.
Thanks for watching. We will see you next week. Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by the viewers like you.